In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon, forgiveness, and remission of all your sins. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, your bountiful goodness fills all creation. Keep us safe from all that may hurt us, that whole and well in body and spirit, we may with grateful hearts accomplish all that you would have us do through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from 2 Kings. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. When she said to her mistress, If only my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? 
Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away, saying, I thought that for me he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you have not done it? How much more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He came and stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. The word of the Lord. We'll read responsively from Psalm 111. Hallelujah, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works and given them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have good understanding. God's praise endures forever. The second lesson is from 2 Timothy. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that this is my gospel for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not changed. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so they may also obtain the salvation that is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. The saying is sure. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this, and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth, the word of the Lord. The 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean, but the other nine? Where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart and the assembly of the upright and the congregation. So opens our psalm today. And it's a beautiful image to have someone so moved by God's mercy that they stand among God's gathered people and proclaim this full-throated, whole-hearted thanksgiving to God for all of the goodness we have received in life. Praying the Psalms uh, on a 30-day cycle actually is and has been for a long time a very central part of my own prayer life. Psalm 111 is read. It's one of four psalms. It's appointed to be prayed at morning prayer on the 23rd day of the month, every month, without fail. And I have uttered these words many times through the years, whether I meant them or not. Uh, let, me, let me clarify a little bit. Part of praying the psalms entails recognizing that sometimes the words that you are praying are more aspirational than anything else. They are dispositions of the heart and mind to which you aspire even if you're not quite there yet. And that's true for me in many ways. And this particular psalm really drives that home. I want to be able to give God thanks without reserve and with my whole heart. And the reality is that most of the time I just don't. In fact, it's an issue that I struggle with. Now I'll be the first to admit that there are many times when I take the blessings of this life, and, and I have a lot of them, but I just take them for granted. I do. And it's something that has become, I think, I think it's something that's entered my awareness more the past few years and certainly has really came to a head during that first year of the pandemic. I'm not going to bore you with the sort of realization or awakening I had or any of its details, but to simply tell you the story that there was this one day where I sat down to lunch um, at home, because I'm working from home an awful lot still these days, and I sat down to eat a sandwich or whatever I was going to have and started muttering the same prayer that I pray over every meal, every day that I've done for decades, where I give God thanks for the, the food that's in front of me when I realize that I, I wasn't really all that thankful for it. And it kind of gave me pause. And so since then, during lunch times, especially when I'm alone, that prayer has shifted from saying, thank you, God, for what I've received, to, dear God, awaken me to what real gratitude is like. Stir my heart. Let me find gratefulness for these things that you have so freely given me that I so often take for granted. 
You would think that if you did something every day for a year and a half or more that you would have had it mastered by then, but um, like most of the rest of my spiritual life, it's still this work that's in progress. Honestly, I'm not sure that I'll ever get to the point of full realization. You know, in today's gospel, we get the story about the centrality of gratitude in life. These ten men, they were afflicted with leprosy, and in the Bible, leprosy refers to any number of skin afflictions, but the thing that they all held in common was that if you had it, your place in society was basically eliminated. That little detail in the story, they called to Jesus from a distance. They called to Jesus from a distance because they couldn't approach him. You lost your place. You had to leave your community. You had to leave your home, your family, your livelihood. And whether you were contagious or not, you were seen as unclean and not even allowed to enter most towns. Many of the lepers of this time would just live on these outskirts of towns and villages begging for help, really dependent on people being merciful to them so that they had the very basics of life that they needed. So Jesus and his disciples, they're making their final um, journey to Jerusalem. You can, it's kind of that part of Luke where we start seeing the rising action, right? There's conflict with the Pharisees. It's getting more intense. His teachings and his parables are becoming more challenging, and we see this focus and determination in the person of Jesus to complete his journey and inaugurate three days that will change the world. And it's in the midst of that growing tension that these ten men cry out for mercy. Now, they obviously knew who Jesus was because they called him out by name. They had heard of his healing powers, of his miracle working, of his compassion, and so they cried out to him for healing. They exhibited faith in a very real way. Now, Jesus could have responded any number of ways that it would have been far more dramatic here. There's no spitting on the ground and rubbing mud in people's eyes. There's no touching them and having them instantaneously healed. No, actually what he does is he... He instructs them to follow the law. He says, go, find the priest, and show him what's going on. And then, then, you know, that, that's it. That's all you have to do. And again, they exhibit faith because they go and do exactly what he was, that they were told to do. But while they were on their way, they all had this realization that the healing had taken place. They were no longer lepers. All they needed was that blessing from the priest before they could return to the lives that they had been forced to leave behind. They could live again. And nine of them did just that. They rushed off to the priest. They did just what Jesus told them. But the Bible says there was one person. Remember, they're, they're traveling between Galilee and Samaria. One person, a Samaritan, not even an Israelite, who upon realizing he had been cured, he stopped his journey to the priest and he turned around and he went back to Jesus. And the gospel writer tells us that the man was ecstatic. He was praising God the whole way back and he makes it back to Jesus and he throws himself down at Jesus' feet and gives thanks for everything that God has wrought in his life. Jesus looks at him and asks, well, what about the others? There were nine others, right? Where, where are they? I think it's kind of cool that Luke doesn't answer the question, or at least doesn't record the answer to the question. So Jesus looks at this man who is bowing at his feet, tells him to get up and go on his way. Go ahead to the priest. Your faith has made you well. What an odd thing to say. I mean, after all, all ten of these men had been cured. Why, why is it that Jesus didn't say something like, all ten of them have been made well by their faith? The answer is pretty simple, really. Here, Jesus distinguishes between the healing 
that they received in the sense of being made well or being made whole. There in our Bible where it says that their faith had made, his faith had made him well, that passage can also be translated to read, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Think about how that slight twist in the way that we read that passage shifts the meaning for just a moment. What we're seeing here is that the fullness of faith, the fullness of faith in Christ looks like living our life as a response to the grace that we have been shown. See, the man didn't return because he was somehow scared that he was going to lose his gift of healing. Jesus didn't somehow, out of wrath, remove the healing from the other nine that went forth without giving thanks, did he? The gift was not conditional. It wasn't a test to see what they would do. And the Samaritan man didn't return because someone wagged their finger at him, kind of like, you know, moms will do, well, don't you need to go say thank you? That person who did something, there's nothing like that either. No, it's because the leper, the leper was filled with gratitude. And before he was going to go and reintegrate himself into his home and his family and his old life, he returned to Jesus praising God for the free gift that he had been given. And so I wonder, when, when you read this story, with whom do you identify? Are you the one who, in the midst of an overwhelming gift of grace, pauses and returns to give thanks? Or, as is more likely, are you, like me, more like the nine of the ten, who received the great gift and then went headlong into that next thing? And I don't think it was a mistake or mere hyperbole that Jesus told a story where 90% of those who received healing sped off into life and only 10% slowed down just for a moment. Just, just for a moment to savor what they had received. I know where I would likely be, and it probably wouldn't be at the feet of Jesus. Think about it maybe another way. The blessings of life that we experience, for how many do we actually show gratitude and how many do we take for granted? Do we even give thanks for 10% of the good things that happen in our life? Do we look around at all of the marvelous things that we encounter and stop to give thanks even for that, that tiny fraction? Or do those blessings of life just get lost in the shuffle of all of the distractions that we have to deal with. And, and I want you to, I, I don't want you to misunderstand something, because I know, I know Thanksgiving's right around the corner, and, and we're going to start seeing all of these little pithy sayings on social media and in grocery stores and in advertisements about how we have to practice an attitude of gratitude, right? It's, which, honestly, is an idea that becomes really toxic because it forces us to suppress our reactions to some very real challenges in life. But what I am suggesting to you is that grace is so abundant and so all-encompassing that we need to learn to open our eyes to it, to experience it, to drink it in and to give thanks for it, even if it's for a passing moment. Because really, that's the whole of the gospel, isn't it? The whole of the gospel is that there is nothing we can do to merit God's grace and mercy. Nothing. It is freely and lavishly given to us. And sometimes it's given to us in these big, demonstrative ways. Sometimes that grace and mercy looks like a Savior hanging on a cross on a Friday afternoon on a hillside. And sometimes it looks like an empty tomb on a Sunday morning. Sometimes it looks like reconciliation between us and God who is our loving Father. And other times, it is simply the grace that we experience little by little, day by day. Those are the things that we often take for granted. It's the grace that we encounter 
and the smile of our spouse and the laughter of a child and the kindness of a stranger and the blueness of the fall sky and the sound of a song that transports us back to a happier place in our lives. Because you see, all of those things and indeed everything that we encounter, it's all grace. All of it is grace. And what the story of the ten lepers teach us is that we need to learn to pause just for a moment and recognize the fact that we are swimming in a sea of grace all around us. To learn to live into that grace, to learn to be thankful for those things that we have received. May God give us the eyes to see that grace that surrounds us and incline our hearts to return thanks and praise to God to whom all thanks and praise belongs. Amen. Let us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. Gracious God, we give you thanks for bishops, pastors, and deacons inspire leaders of the church to proclaim your mighty deeds that your saving faith may be known to all. Lord, in your mercy. 
We give you thanks for land and water, seed time and harvest, break down boundaries we construct between ourselves and the rest of your creation. Bring renewal and restoration to places affected by pollution and deforestation. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks for those in our community, nation, and world who work for justice and peace. Guide those who govern to act on behalf of those marginalized by race, ethnicity, or religion. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks that you hear the cries of those in need. Restore to community those who are stigmatized by illness, feel rejected, or live in isolation. Send healing to all who suffer, especially all those on our prayer list and those who we name now, aloud or silently. Lord, in your mercy, eternal God, we give you thanks for your faithful people who have gone before us to your glory. Renew our trust in your eternal promises of mercy, redemption, and new life. Lord, in your mercy, with grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O God, ever trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We give you thanks, Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, whom you sent in the sin of the ages to save and redeem us and to proclaim to us your will. He is your word, inseparable from you, through whom you created all things and in whom you take delight. He is your word, sent from heaven to a virgin's womb. He there took on our nature and our lot and was shown forth as your Son, born of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary. He, our Lord Jesus, fulfilled all your will and won for you a holy people. He stretched out his hands in suffering in order to free from suffering those who trust you. He is the one who, handed over to a death he freely accepted, in order to destroy death, to break the bonds of the evil one, to crush hell underfoot, to give light to the righteous, to establish his covenant and to show forth the resurrection, taking bread and giving thanks to you said, take and eat, this is my body given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and resurrection, we take this bread and cup, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve you as your priestly people. Send your spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith and truth, that we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. In, instead of the bubbly, enthusiastic president, you get to hear from the church treasurer. So go ahead and get the groaning out of the way. Sorry. Uh, just, just a couple, couple minutes. Uh, ushers are handing out a piece of paper because when I start talking about numbers, everyone's eyes glaze over. So I uh, want to talk just for a few minutes today about the capital campaign. Um, as most of you know, we uh, spent probably well over a decade 
uh, in our storefront. Our goal was always to be in our own facility. We had to raise money to do that. Uh, capital campaigns are kind of what you do to raise money to purchase a building. Uh, many of you might remember the Raise the Roof project we did for a couple of years. So anyhow, that kind of all rolled into the capital campaign. Um, by the grace of God, we ended up in this beautiful facility here and were a actually able to purchase it um, as a congregation back in 2017. Uh, at that point, uh, typically a capital campaign is kind of a self-enclosed one-time thing to raise money, but the, the council decided at that point to kind of keep the fund ongoing, so uh, we would use that to basically pay the mortgage every month. Um, our goal at that point in time was to try and keep about six months worth of uh, funds in there just in case of an emergency. Uh, so kind of with those parameters in mind, our mortgage payment every month is just a little bit over $3,000. So uh, that translates, of course, into about $36,000 in any given year. Um, so our goal as a council back in 2017 was to keep about $18,000 as a buffer in that fund. Uh, and unlike normal capital campaigns, this was gonna be sort of an ongoing, we keep giving to it and the mortgage payment comes out of that fund. So it's totally outside of our normal budgetary process every year. So anyhow, I of course keep up with this uh, as time goes along and I just really wanted to uh, bring to your attention kind of where things have happened over the course of the last five or six years um, and where we are at at this point in time. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about every one of these little numbers, but you can kind of see basically the main things to see are, are how much money has come in, how much has gone out, and kind of what the balance of the fund is, which is really the, the very bottom line each year. Um, and of course the, the pandemic showed up, so we kind of expected as a council that 2020 and 2021 were gonna be a little iffy, which they were, but um, we're hopefully sort of getting back to normal. Uh, and I just really wanted to kind of share with you where we are with the capital campaign. Um, and as you can see down in the very bottom right-hand corner, we don't have six months of surplus anymore. We barely have like one. <laughs> so um, again, the council wanted me just to talk to you for a few minutes and to remind everybody, especially those of you who might be new and, and kind of don't know the history of all this too, that the, uh, the capital campaign is, is still ongoing uh, and we hope that the members of the congregation would provide enough funding to it so that we can keep paying the mortgages out of that. Because I think the last thing we wanna do at this point is to have to kind of shift this over to our general budget and try and make the mortgage payments out of that. So I can, I can kind of assure you right now, we don't take in 3,000 extra dollars every month to pay the mortgage. So anyhow, the council wanted me to, to just kind of uh, let the congregation know kind of where we stand with that. Um, so anyhow, that's a lot of numbers for you to absorb, but bottom line is uh, we need to kind of emphasize again that this is an ongoing fund that we very much need your support to, to keep things going. So anyhow, that's my talk. Anybody have any questions? I'll be glad to answer them. Anybody? Going once, going twice. You know where to find me. I'm always around. So, Okay, here's the happy person. Good afternoon, everyone. Such a blessing to see everybody here at St. Luke, where our hearts and our doors are always open to each of you. Uh, pay real close attention that's going on in, in the bulletin. Uh, new members class, if you're interested in joining the church, if you're not already a member, uh, please see the pastor. There's a sign up, okay. Um, and that's on All Saints Sunday on November 6th. That the, okay. God bless you. 
classes next Sunday and the following Sunday at 9.30 a.m. during the Sunday school hour. Okay. We'll be receiving new members on um, All Saints Sunday. Okay. Um, and the gathering, um, that's going to be at uh, Judy and Ed's house in Jackson. Is that right? Did I say that right? Um, and she did let us know that uh, you might want to bring a blanket. If it starts raining, she'll get to go inside, but you guys have to stay outside. So I'm just sorry about that. <laughs> but she, she lives on the lake. It's going to be kind of cold, you know, if you're going there. So uh, bring, a, bring a jacket with you or whatever. Lake wind can be a little bit colder. They always have good food and it's good fellowship. So uh, put that on your calendars. Uh, the Feast of St. Luke is on October the 18th. Um, and we'll be observing the feast day on our divine service October the 16th. Is that right? Name day. Next thing. Okay. Um, and due to a scheduling conflict, our uh, council meeting is usually the third Sunday of every month. It's now the fourth on October the 23rd. It'll be here at the church after the service. Um, October Fest, Saturday, October 29th. This is always a great time and fellowship with everyone here. Uh, where is it going to be at? It's going to be here at, at the church. church. Okay. And there is a there is a sign up out there, and the only reason that I put one out there is that we're asking. I feel weird talking to you. My back to <laughs> we are asking people to um, you know just bring something to share, a dish or something to share. Um, if if you would prefer an adult beverage in addition to tea, water, soda, um, you bring your own. Um, we won't be BYOB. purchasing any with church funds. Um, and then the other thing is, I'm going to fire up the grill because we. You, you got to have bratwurst, bratwurst right? Yeah. So um, there's a little place. If you want brats or a burger, just put the number. That you, I'm just trying to get a rough count, not exact, and I'll, I'll cook some brats for that okay. and burgers. Okay. Sounds like a great time. We always have fun when we do this. So, you know, come, please come join us. Um, Connie, you'd like to talk about Lutheran Rural Relief? I'm happy today. <laughs> Okay, I have the report for that. The collection for personal care kits was very successful. The ladies assembled 36 kits at the last gathering, and then with the help of a Thrivent grant and some additional donations, we made 18 more kits. So we had a total of 54 kits. Thrivent paid the postage to send the packages to the Lutheran World Relief Warehouse in Maryland, but additional funds are needed to get the kits to their final destinations. If you would like to make a monetary donation to assist with shipping costs, make your check to the church and put Lutheran World Relief or LWR ship in the shipping memo line. And thank you. Thanks, Connie. We appreciate you helping out Debbie that way. Okay, um, and now, you know, it's Thanksgiving. Christmas is coming up, and our, our turkey is back in town. And it's on the window out in the narthex. So if you have, it's the, how we get the, the, the uh, food for our Thanksgiving food boxes. So if you can take one, two, whatever you're led to take, please take them by what's on the list and you bring them back. Are we going to collect them in the narthex or are we going to do it in the Sunday school room? Do we know, Mary food, Beth? Food will come in here. It'll come in here. And then when it's time, we'll bless it. And then we'll come, go to our, our Thanksgiving food boxes. Um, also, and it, we were speaking to council earlier, it is that time of year. We've gotten our nominating committee together. So if you ever thought about serving on, on uh, uh, council, um, if someone approaches you, all I ask is that you don't say no right away. Uh, <laughs> if you think about it for a minute, either get their phone number, whoever asked you get their phone number, their email, or wait till the next Sunday, but just pray about it. Because um, Lord and I had to talk about two weeks before I said I would run. So, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So we ask that you pray about it. And if you're led to be a leader in the church, uh, please. It's me and Tony, Tony and Larry and Paul and uh, Barbara and Kelly. Kelly Glow is also part of that. So any of those people you see, any council member that you see or anybody that you see that you want to say something to, let them know that you're interested so we can uh, uh, let the pastor know and get you on the list. Uh, there's also a couple of cards in the Northex. Uh, the Bark Dolls uh, daughter, Laura, did I say that right, Laura? Yeah, Laura is having surgery. So they asked for prayers for her for next week. Um, and there's also a card from Miss Judy, Judy Jenkins. Um, she's having uh, surgery also. 
Uh, and so we would like to sign a card. She's always given us cards. I'd like to have a card for her too. Okay, did I miss anything? Yard sale. Yard sale. Oh. So I want to first of all thank everybody who donated, who came to help. Um, we had an army of people here Friday, most of the day yesterday, and without all of that, this would not have been the success that it was. I'm up here to tell you that we made the most we've ever made at a yard sale. Um, I am honestly shocked because when we were going through what we had, I was thinking, oh no, <laughs> um, this is not going to end well. But it did. It ended very well. We ended up with, in cash and checks yesterday, thirteen sixty nine forty nine. Um, we have some online payment. We, we added Apple Pay and other things this year, so we have the online payments that have not been accounted for yet. So we will have somewhere between $1,450 and $1,500 for the Thanksgiving food boxes after all of that is accounted for. So thank you. Thank you for all your help. Great job, Azelle, and everybody that was there to help him do that. That's a big thing for us. So thank you all for giving your time of that. Okay, any other announcements? All right, Mark. Let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord.